Good evening and welcome back. My name is David Mueller from Casa Esther Catholic Worker Community. Tonight we invite you, if you would like, to turn your cameras on and leave them on to create more of a community atmosphere. We also invite you to post your questions and comments in the chat, or you can send questions in the chat directly to Casa Esther. During the Q&A, we will directly reach out to you ahead of time and ask if you'd like to ask the question yourself or if you'd prefer that we ask for you. In the two previous events, our speakers referenced scriptures and theology during their presentations. But tonight the focus will be precisely on the scriptural, theological and ecclesial foundations of nonviolence. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator for tonight uh, is Eliane Lakeham. Eliane was one of our presenters in week one and she's back uh, tonight serving as our moderator and we're happy to have her. Um, so Eliane Lakeham is an experienced facilitator and community organizer with a background in peace and security, housing and climate justice, and education in emergencies. Her work focuses on advancing nonviolence and promoting women's participation as critical actors in all efforts to achieve sustainable peace and justice. She is also board coordinator of the DC Peace Team. Welcome Eliane and it's all yours now. Thanks David, I'm so glad to be back and I hope that my network is better this time. Hey, hello everyone. I'm delighted to be with you all tonight and excited about this very important conversation. But before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge those who came before us and the people whose land we all stand on. I would also like to welcome all those who are joining us tonight, especially students, the faculty, the staff. Tonight's session is being recorded and will be available for viewing later. Our format for this discussion is the following. Each speaker, we have about 20 minutes to share their perspective on today's topic. As David mentioned earlier, we will hold our Q&A session until the end of the second presentation. We started this series with a question, why nonviolence? We learn on week one that nonviolence is a way of life, a spirituality, an essential tool with which we are called to respond to the most pressing issue of our time, ranging from the threat of nuclear weapons to climate change. But more importantly, we learn that nonviolence is at the core of the gospel and that it works. On week two, we continue the series by exploring the power of nonviolence to powerful example of its effectiveness. We learn that nonviolence is contextual and we receive a clear call to fully commit to the centrality of gospel nonviolence. Joining us tonight are two outstanding scholars whose contribution to the promotion of gospel nonviolence are unparalleled. Without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker. Our first speaker, Casey Choi, teaches Asian American theology and theological ethics at Princeton Theological Seminary, a reform and economical graduate theological school in New Jersey. He is the former chair of the religion department at Seton Hall University, which is part of the Ash Diocese of Newark. One of his current projects is a Christological reflection on racial violence and freedom. Our second speaker, Lisa Sol Cahill, is a professor of theology at Boston College, a Catholic Jesuit university. She's the author of the 2019 book, Bless Are the Peacemaker, Pacifism, Just War Theory, and Peace Building. She has worked with the Catholic Peace Building Network Past Christian International and the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. Welcome, Cassie and Lisa. I will now turn it over to you, Cassie. 
Thank you. Oh, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, great. Thank you very much, Elian, for introducing me and Professor Cahill. Um, I'd also like to thank David Mueller, Mary, uh, Marie Dennis, and Eli McCarthy, and Pax Christie, and the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative for the invitation to participate in tonight's event on the Biblical Foundations for Nonviolence and the Church's teachings on nonviolence. And it's an honor to be here, especially with Lisa Cahill, um, all the way over there in Boston. Uh, while Professor Kale will focus more on the church and nonviolence, what I want to do is a little prefatory work um, and focus on scripture itself and uh, focus on a couple of key theological themes in scripture. I think it's important to first state that the Bible is never self-interpreting, but the Bible's meanings and explanations, as the famous theological ethicist James Gustafson noted, are carried through communities. In other words, to state the point more plainly and directly, how we regard the Bible, what we see in the Bible, and what we think is important the, about the Bible is highly dependent on the kind of community that reads and interprets the Bible. So for a community committed to nonviolence, what can we say about scripture? What does the Bible reveal? Well, it's going to sound a little cliche-ish, but the answer is it's complicated especially when it comes to the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. So just to um, give you a sense of um, how complicated it is, um, I just want to um, draw your attention to a couple of passages in the Hebrew Bible. Um, for instance, um, Exodus 12, um, Exodus being the second book of the Hebrew Bible, um, chapter 12. And um, I, I won't read the entire passage just for the sake of time, but I'll um, just quickly um, bring you up to sp speed. Um, ex Exodus chapter 12 is when um, we find um, the Israelites who are enslaved by the Egyptians and um, um, God, Yahweh, um, as um, God is known um, in the Hebrew Bible, um, calls um, to Moses um, to appear in front of Pharaoh. Um, and um, to demand that um, the Israelites are um, let free, are liberated. And um, God Yahweh, the Lord Yahweh, um, tells Moses that um, God will um, show um, Pharaoh that it is indeed God who is commanding him um, to let the Israelites go. One of the last um, acts that God um, brings down upon um, Pharaoh and the Egyptians to show that it is indeed um, um, the God, uh, that God is um, demanding um, the freedom of the Israelites, is the taking of the firstborn um, in the land of Egypt. And um, God tells um, Moses that um, in order to spare the firstborn of those um, in, uh, among the Israelites, that they ought to um, uh, sacrifice um, one of their animals and paint um, the blood um, around the door so that the angel of death um, will um, escape um, their homes. And indeed, they do so, and the angel of death escapes their homes. But um, to those um, of Egyptian families, the firstborn and, and also the, the firstborn of their animals, um, all are, um, are, they all perish. So Exodus 12, that is the story that we find. Um, take um, as another example, um, Exodus 14. Um, Exodus 14 is where um, Pharaoh finally relinquishes and um, lets um, the Israelites free. And as the Israelites are uh, escaping um, Egypt, um, going towards um, their freedom, um, Pharaoh changes his mind. Um, and regrets letting the Israelites go. And Pharaoh um, sends um, the Egyptian army um, after the Israelites to bring them back um, into slavery. Um, at this point in Exodus 14, however, the Israelites are in front of the Red Sea and are unable to cross. But Yahweh um, tells Moses um, to, um, to have faith and to keep moving forward for um, God will um, split the Red Sea in half and allow safe passage to the Israelites. And so the Israelites are uh, moving through the Red Sea um, safely, and um, the Egyptian army is following 
um, the Israelites um, through this passage in the Red Sea. But as the Israelites um, are, are safe and the Egyptian army um, is in the middle of the Red Sea, um, God folds the Red Sea um, back together and um, in, in essence um, drowns the Egyptian army, wipes them out. And then of course, there is the um, well-known story in the book of Joshua, uh, specifically chapter six, the destruction of Jericho, um, which I won't um, speak of now, um, but if you have the chance, um, you can read that um, on your own um, when you have time. But, in, um, but here, um, on behalf of the Israelites, God destroys an entire city. These passages, especially the ones from Exodus, was deeply troubling to Father Daniel Berrigan, perhaps best known for his participation in the Plowshares Movement, um, a movement um, against um, nuclear proliferation. While the Exodus narratives are often read as a story of liberation, Berrigan struggled mightily with the fact that the liberation for some, in this case, the Israelites, meant death for others, in this case, the Egyptians, and later the Canaanites. So how can we rejoice in these deaths, even if it means that these deaths are in the service of liberation for others? Thus, we are informed early on that God takes sides, Berrigan wrote, expressing some worry over this fact. But it is precisely because God takes sides that allows us to detect another narrative that undergirds the, the Hebrew Bible and binds the Hebrew Bible to the New Testament. Indeed, God takes sides. But when we step back and approach scripture as a whole, we see that God always takes sides with those who are the victims of history, who are marginalized, exploited, and excluded. And as a consequence, God is preeminently interested in restoring right relationality. So let us consider another passage from the Hebrew Bible, this time from Genesis chapter 4, the first book of the Hebrew Bible, where we find the Cain and Abel story. We can certainly focus on other passages from the Hebrew Bible as well, but for the sake of time, this one um, story from Genesis chapter 4 will have to do. Some of some of what I'm about to say about the Cain and Abel story is explicated in greater detail and quite beautifully in the book Advancing Nonviolence and Just Peace in the Church and World. For now, I simply want us to notice the following features of the Cain and Abel story. Cain is a farmer and Abel is, well, I guess we can say is a shepherd or maybe a rancher. For whatever reason, God favors Abel and his offering of meat, while God does not favor Cain's offering of fruit from his fields. And so Cain is jealous of this difference and kills his younger brother, Abel. And Cain basically, um, if you read the story um, closely, Cain basically ambushes his brother, Abel, in a field. Afterwards, God appears to Cain and asks where his brother, Abel, is. And Cain responds rather infamously, I do not know, am I my brother's keeper? And well, God says, yes, you are your brother's keeper, despite any differences that might exist between the two of them. Fear of difference, fear of the other is not a legitimate basis for exclusion and violence. Just as God loves that which is not him, that is creation or us, so too we ought to even love those who are other and different. But what is especially important to note is that despite tra Cain's transgression, which is the sundering of relationship through violence, God does not in turn punish Cain with violence, but rather punishes him, um, and you can put punishes in quotes, by protecting him. That is, while God banishes Cain to be, um, as scripture tells us, a wanderer on the earth, he is not to be harmed in any way. So here we see God who complicates the familiar lex talionis, the law of retaliation of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So the Cain and Abel story alerts us to another narrative in scripture, one in which God is a God of mercy, who seeks justice and right relationship, but through means other than retribution and violence. Such a vision of God is certainly pronounced and furthered in the New Testament, and we can turn to a few examples. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to um, refer to them here. I won't read um, these examples um, again for the sake of time, um, nor will I uh, provide um, a complete summary. But um, just take, for example, Matthew chapter 5, 
and uh, Luke chapter six. Both of these um, are um, two versions of the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, where you find um, the, um, the command to love your enemies. Or you might consider Luke chapter 10, where you find the parable of the Good Samaritan, where um, uh, I'm sure many of us are familiar um, with um, the story, um, the parable of the Samaritan, an outcast of, of society who stops to address the wounds of someone who has been beaten and robbed. And um, Jesus asks um, 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 what it means to be a neighbor in this story. And um, we are told that being a neighbor is doing what the Samaritan does, which is to take care of um, the person who has been left for dead. And Jesus tells us to go and do likewise as the Samaritan. The narrative of a God who is merciful, who sides with those who are victims of history and marginalized, and seeks to restore right relationship through love rather than violence, is exemplified in the New Testament's account of Jesus's crucifixion. With that in mind, what I'm about to say moves into what we theologians call matters pertaining to Christology. In the Gospel of John, uh, this is the fourth gospel, particularly in the 18th chapter, we are told of how one of Jesus's disciples, Judas, betrays Jesus and aids in Jesus's arrest. This arrest, this arrest begins the series of events that leads him to leads Jesus to appear before the Ro the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, who eventually sentences Jesus to death on the cross. As Jesus is about to be arrested, another disciple, Peter, draws his sword to intervene. But Jesus rebukes Peter's turn to violence and tells him in no uncertain terms, and this is a direct quote from John uh, chapter 18, verse 11, put your sword back into its sheath. While Jesus does not condemn Peter for possessing a sword, Jesus clearly condemns Peter for using his sword. This rejection of violence continues to Jesus' eventual crucifixion. It is on the cross that Jesus takes up upon himself the burdens of the outcast, the marginalized, the other. In other words, as crucified, Jesus suffers with and like the victims of history. And in so suffering, Jesus does not valorize suffering. There is no redemptive suffering in this account. But rather, Jesus in suffering on the cross Jesus underscores the futility of violence, that violence only breeds suffering, and more violence breeds only more suffering. In other words, violence leads nowhere except to death, to both perpetrator and to the perpetrated, which runs counter to, I might add, how we ordinarily think about security, what it means to protect ourselves from purported criminality. So consider our contemporary moment with the perceived increase in crime, how it has motivated calls for greater force, in essence, violence to keep communities safe. But the cross of Christ challenges us to consider the cost of such violence, to consider who is further marginalized and disaffected when we respond to calls for safety through more violence, through more force. More force only breeds more disaffection and thus more criminality which then leads to more calls for force, and so on, and so on. In accepting the cross, Jesus thus ends the cycle of violence and suffering. And in his resurrection, Jesus points to the way of reconciliation and forgiveness as the path towards justice and right relationship. But reconciliation and forgiveness are only possible through the generative work of the Holy Spirit or so scripture proposes. With that in mind, let me just conclude here with one last comment on the critical importance of the Holy Spirit or on pneumatology in more technical theological language for understanding the meaning of nonviolence. God calls us to nonviolence through the works of mercy, which include reconciliation and forgiveness. So nonviolence as scripture proposes is not passivity, in other words, it's not to do nothing. Um, it is not to um, uh, simply step aside. But rather, 
nonviolence, as scripture proposes, is radically action-oriented. Mercy and thus reconciliation and forgiveness are essentially performative, and therefore they are not simply attitudes or states of mind and the like. But the nonviolent actions of mercy and thus reconciliation and forgiveness is made possible through God's sending of a spirit upon us. Scripture attests to the power of God's spirit at Pentecost as described in Acts um, chapter 2. And let me just quickly read um, the first four verses of Acts chapter 2 where um, Pentecost is um, initiated. So um, again, so this is Acts chapter two, verses one through four. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together and all these are the disciples. Uh, and remember, this is after um, the um, um, uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Christ and all the uh, disciples are gathered together. So when the day of Pentecost has come, they, um, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. So you really get a, a, a sense here of the Holy Spirit descending upon the dis disciples, and something is happening here. The Holy Spirit descends upon them and and um, they, they are empowered in, in, a, um, in a particular way. And it's that empowerment um, that I think um, is um, worthy of our attention um, in um, the context of our discussion of nonviolence. So to be more specific, now all of this talk of the power of the Holy Spirit in the Bible can sound a bit magical. But I think one productive way of thinking about the power of the Holy Spirit is to think of the transformative power of encountering others as persons and thus encountering others not as means to an end or as opportunities for self gain and so forth. This language, by the way, of encounter is one that Pope Francis turns to specifically, especially in his 2019 social encyclical for Tuli Tutti. And perhaps uh, Professor Cahill will elaborate on it. The New Testament is replete with accounts of how persons are transformed by their encounters. And um, again, if you go back to Acts, um, um, the book of Acts, um, after the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples, you have um, Peter and, and, and the other disciples um, uh, essentially moving out through the Roman Empire, encountering um, all sorts of communities. Um, in their um, work of spreading the gospel. But in addition to that, um, the New Testament is, is full of accounts of how persons are transformed by their encounters with Jesus. And in each of these encounters, Jesus sees the person before him, whether friend, stranger, or foe, as worthy of his love. And in each instance, they are worthy because they are inherently valuable as persons no more and no less. And being accepted in such a way, all those who encounter Jesus are invited into friendship with God. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. perhaps captured this point in an especially powerful way when he wrote that the goal of nonviolence is to transform the enemy into a friend. And, and one of the more powerful things that um, among many uh, that Dr. King um, uh, shared with, um, with all of us is this idea that um, agape, the goal, um, agape, self-giving love, um, uh, that agape's goal is always um, um, filial love, friendship love. So if the death and resurrection of Jesus ultimately reveals the folly of violence and the priority of reconciliation and forgiveness, then the Holy Spirit of God reveals to us that reconciliation and forgiveness is only possible when we are willing to risk ourselves to be with others and for others, no matter how different they may be from us. Thus, solidarity and accompaniment are moral priorities, and correlatively, the challenging of conventional patterns of relationality and conventional notions of belonging and community. Furthermore, it is only through kenosis, that is, 
um, and this is a, a term for emptying ourselves um, that you'll find um, in um, Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Furthermore, it is only through kenosis, that is, when we empty ourselves or curtail what we desire over and against the interests and the good of others, that we begin to reveal and ultimately undermine the violent logic of domination, exploitation, and exclusion, which destroys community rather than builds it up. So in sum, and I'll keep this to one sentence, I promise. So in summary, when we risk ourselves for others, only when we are willing to encounter others, perhaps is another way of putting it, that is when the spirit of God is present and the nonviolence of God's love manifests itself most powerfully in the world. Okay, thank you very much, um, everyone, for listening um, to this. Appreciate it. Um, Professor Cahill, I turn now the Zoom floor over to you. <laughs> thank you, Casey. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, yes, I think my, I think I am unmuted. That's a a uh, mistake that I often make. So thank you very much. I am delighted to see four or five or six of my theologian friends among the uh, attendants and also uh, to see that you've brought with you a good number of students. So we're very happy to be passing on this message and we know that you two will carry it forth, probably expressing it to a new generation and ways that are better than we can do. So I am going to, um, Kind of more or less pick up where Casey left off and that is so primarily I'm going to talk about the church uh, but I'm going to pick up uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit and just to give you a little preview I am first of all going to um, follow fairly closely the contents of the book that is the backbone for this series called Advancing Nonviolence and Just Peace in the Church and the World and the part of that that we're addressing tonight is part two, and that is the Christian Foundations of Nonviolence. So um, Casey, Professor Choi has focused on the biblical resources in particular, and I am not going to specifically go back to Jesus Christ, but I'm going to pick up with the Spirit and keeping in mind the passage from Acts about Pentecost uh, and the church, or I'm going to take that and apply it to the church. Uh, and then look at the role of nonviolence for the church and its mission. And so I'm going to cover five basic topics or points. The first is the Holy Spirit and ecclesiology. And ecclesiology is simply the theology of the church. The second is eschatology and the church. Eschatology is theologies about how the world is related to the world to come or the church in the world are related to the world to come when the reign of God preached by Jesus will be fulfilled. The third topic is the church as a social and political presence, the social mission of the church, especially as grounded in Catholic ecclesiology after Vatican II. Fourthly, I will go to some church documents. So we'll be referencing a long tradition in the Catholic Church called Catholic Social Teaching. And the documents illustrate the church's mission to the world. And what we will particularly focus on is the inclusion of nonviolence, peace building, and just peace as part of the mission of the church. The fifth point uh, is something that's um, a bit more controversial. And it is taken up by this book, Advancing Nonviolence. And specifically, it is the tension between nonviolent just peace and self-defense or protection of the innocent in Catholic social teaching, including the remarks of Pope Francis. And I'm bringing this tension up not to go back and defend just war theory because we're keeping our focus here on nonviolence, but rather to emphasize the importance 
of bringing as many partners as possible under the tent of nonviolent peace building. I think that's really essential to bring in as many as possible if the nonviolence of the church is to reduce the violence of the world. And also that big tent approach is consistent with a Catholic ecclesiology. Vatican II, after all, was addressed not only to the church or to Christians, but to the modern world in general, with its hopes and fears, joys and anxieties, to paraphrase the beginning of one of its most important documents, which is Gaudium et Spes. So first then, the Holy Spirit and the church. As Professor Choi already uh, read to you, well, he read to you uh, four verses from the beginning of Acts 2, so I won't repeat that. The gist of it, though, is that the disciples are gathered in one place. They're probably afraid of the same people that killed Jesus. Uh, suddenly, they hear the rush of a wind and uh, tongues of fire appear, and each one of them received a tongue of fire and was filled with the Holy Spirit. So the message that we can take out of that, obviously, is that the Holy Spirit brings the fire of courage and the wind of power. The Holy Spirit overcomes fear, inspires action, and enables the disciples to carry the gospel to the whole world, which is uh, symbolized by the fact that all the disciples now can speak in words that diverse cultures can understand. One thing that I want especially to emphasize is that the church formed in the Holy Spirit is a community. It's not just inspired individuals or saints. Rather, the message, I think, is that together we are the body of Christ in the world. So as a community, we support and empower one another together. Let me just read you a text from Advancing Nonviolence that brings home that point. And this is on page 225 for those of you, again, who are using the book. In an age, uh, oops, sorry, called to be a people of nonviolence, the church exists for the sake of God's nonviolent reign. Beginning with the power of the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost, the church emerged as a liberating and peaceable community of disciples. The sacraments, especially baptism and the Eucharist, which are shared by all the Christian churches, are about communal identity and belonging to the community and experiencing together in and through one another the presence of Jesus Christ. Again, from the book that we're reading in common, we have a few words on the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, we remember the victim on the cross. We anticipate the future, that's eschatology, by calling down the heavenly banquet to the altar, our altar and we are formed into the body of Christ by eating the body of Christ and drinking his blood. Christ's act of nonviolent self-sacrifice, as Professor Choi was discussing, is available to us in the Lord's Supper, incorporating us, all of us, into Christ's reconciled and reconciling body. So that then leads us to the next point, which is eschatology and the church. And the main thing here is that God's reality is already present and effective among us. That's what Jesus preaching of the reign of God, the central symbol of his ministry was about. Traditionally though, or theologically, eschatology has meant the last things. So we tend to project imaginatively to the end of the world or to eternal life. But in the New Testament, there's a more complex meaning to the reign of God and eschatology. Eschatology isn't only about the fullness of God's reign as it will be in the future. It is also about God's future as already available to the life of the, of the church now. There's what biblical scholars call a kind of already not yet dynamic. The kingdom is already, the reign of God is already here among us, and yet it's not yet complete, except through the grace of God in the eschaton, in eternal life. And uh, 
a passage uh, uh, from page 203 in the text is this. And this text represents both the incompleteness and sometimes the failure of the church, as well as the potential for achieving what we hope for. Despite the church's history, which has at times legitimated violence, women and men of faith and whole movements within the church have lived the discipleship of Jesus' nonviolence over the past two millennia. And my third point, which is the political action of the church follows from this, because the gospel message is not just about the church living nonviolence, it is about the church carrying this message and this mission and this practice to the world as a whole. So I mentioned that in the Catholic church, this is captured in a series of Catholic social encyclicals by the Pope. So they're messages from the popes that began back at the end of the 19th century and continue right up today with Pope Francis. We can think of Laudato Si on the environment. That's probably the best known. Also this most recent encyclical that Professor Choi mentioned, Fratelli Tutti, and I'll give you just a few words on that in a couple of minutes. One of the most important documents of the um, uh, Second Vatican Council, Council in the 1960s, it's not an encyclical, but it fits into this tradition, is called Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. And this whole social tradition continues in every kind of action uh, today and before, but today, especially as we're discussing for just peace and against any kind of violence. So um, I'd like to read you a, a summary, again, from our common text of examples of political action around nonviolence that follow from the social mission of the church. Followers of Jesus have played pivotal roles in developing positive, innovative approaches to addressing violence, injustice, human rights violations, and war. These include restorative justice, like Victor Offender reconciliation programs or peace circles, forgiveness and reconciliation training, third party intervention and unarmed civilian protection and accompaniment, such as Witness for Peace, Christian peacemaker teams, nonviolent peace force, Operation Dove, nonviolent communication, conflict transformation programming, trauma healing, anti-racism training, and innumerable initiatives for interfaith dialogue. Uh, and those were all from page 214. And even as you hear those, you can recognize, you know, those kinds of activities are not limited to the church, right? And in fact, they wouldn't have as large a social impact if they were limited to the church. So this is a signal in our text advancing nonviolence, as well as from Catholic social teaching, that we are to have an inclusive mission and to seek partners. And we do that in the hope that we can make a difference. So to sum up, all of these activities are, yes, part of Christian identity as Christian but they're also part of the mission of the church in the world. They're a sign of the resurrection. They're the work of the spirit in the world. And they're an embodiment of the inbreaking reign of God, partly present now, albeit to be completed later. And of course, nonviolence is always an essential dimension of authentic Christian life and of ecclesial faithfulness and belonging, not just of individual holy people, but of ecclesial faithfulness and belonging to the church. Fourthly then, I'll just mention a few church teaching documents and I've already started to do that. And in the book, these are at the very beginning of part two, that is before the things that I've already mentioned, but the documents actually follow from the biblical and theological claims that were clarified in the rest of part two and that Professor Choi already discussed and I did a little bit as well up to this point in my talk. So these documents, as I mentioned, would include the documents of Vatican II, especially Gaudium et Spes, and writings and speeches of all of the popes, even since Benedict the 16th, uh, sorry, the 15th, not only the 16th, 
who was the Pope before Pope Francis. And Benedict XV was Pope during World War I. And he constantly spoke out against war as not the right solution. He used Vatican funds to support refugees. And he was um, a leader and an example uh, to the later expressions of nonviolence and hope for nonviolence that came from the later popes. So all of these popes, that is from Benedict XV forward, including the documents of, of Vatican II, they have consistently held that armed force is neither a moral nor a Christian, nor actually an effective route to peace. So uh, of course there's hundreds of pages of these documents and I'm not going to go into all of those here, but I will uh, read you just uh, three select quotes from Pope John the 23rd, Pope during the council, Paul VI who took over when John the 23rd passed away also during the council, uh, and John Paul II, and then I'll follow up with Pope Francis. So uh, John the 23rd wrote an encyclical called Peace on Earth, and he said in that encyclical, it is contrary to reason, that is not just to the gospel, but even to reason, to hold that war is now a suitable way to restore rights which have been violated. Um, from uh, Paul VI, we have, uh, sorry, I, there we go, Paul VI, um, and I'm on pages 78 to 81. Paul VI emphasizes that reconciliation is the way to, to peace, and he declared no more war, war never again. Peace, it is peace which must guide the destinies of people and of all mankind. And finally, then, in the same vein, John Paul II rejects the possibility of war as what he calls a decline for humanity and a defeat for humanity. He says a peace obtained by arms could only prepare new acts of violence. So rejecting the inevitability of war in, in every case, he urges dialogue and diplomacy in accord with international law. Now, uh, let's turn, uh, even if only briefly, to our current uh, papal leader, Pope Francis. Pr Professor Choi mentioned that I might give just a bit of time to his most recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti. And um, what that means is all brothers or everyone is our brother. Uh, and, uh, and, and it refers also to fraternity, uh, the Italian, uh, the translation of the Italian word, uh, but not just meaning men, but rather brotherhood and sisterhood. And he clarifies over and over that he is addressing this to brothers and sisters, to women as well as men. And that is so important because of a lacuna in a lot of Catholic social teaching, and that is the simple fact of holding women up equally with men as social activists, social leaders, and political leaders, and most importantly, as among the foremost peacemakers in local communities. Um, women are at the forefront of peace building efforts everywhere, and that's something that, frankly, the document history of the Catholic Church has yet to fully recognize. But in Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis is very explicit in constantly naming sisters as well as brothers. And with regard to war, he echoes the earlier popes, saying that uh, we are called to peace, war is always a failure, and that in practice, there is no such thing as a truly just war, whatever may have been the just cause, because war not only kills human beings, obviously, but always brings along harm to civilians, harm to property, exacerbation of divisions, destruction of uh, civilian infrastructure. So spirals of violence, as Professor Choi was mentioning, are almost always a consequence of war. Perhaps the most important document um, offered by 
uh, Pope Francis, though, is not an encyclical, or at least I would argue this, or, or a council document, but his 2017 World Day of Peace message. And this is discussed in part two on pages 85 and following. And what is so very important about this statement is that not only does it reiterate everything that I have just said, but it has a very practical political message. And it is this, nonviolent resistance to evil and justice is not only required by the gospel and by humanity and by principles of justice, it is also a practical political strategy that can be effective. The Pope is saying that nonviolence is effective in the real world of politics. And many examples are given in this book. And in fact, earlier in lectures in this series and in some of the lectures to come. The fifth thing then uh, to bring up and the final thing is the uneasy relation of gospel nonviolence. And what we have to admit as this book, Advancing Nonviolence does very clearly, uh, the continuing papal recognition, albeit a rather marginal recognition, of at least a minimal and so-called just war, right to self-defense and of humanitarian intervention. On the one hand, this book, Advancing Nonviolence, names war as what it calls a countersign to the coming reign of God. Yet on the other hand, neither the principle of just defense nor that of defense of the innocent or humanitarian intervention, the responsibility to protect, has ever been renounced by the Catholic tradition. John Paul II affirmed the morality or the justice of humanitarian intervention in some cases. And more recently, as we know, Pope Francis, after prolonged and continual exhortations to peace in, in Ukraine, finally did briefly add that Ukraine has a right to defend itself against extreme aggression aimed at destroying Ukraine as a nation. Now, this presents, I think, something of a dilemma for us as nonviolent peace builders. And I do not actually have a definitive analysis or a resolution of this dilemma. I just don't think uh, it's adequate to ignore that it's there. And I credit this book for detailing the reasons why not. Uh, so instead of resolving the dilemma, I'm going to just offer four reflections. The first is that perhaps there is some real ambiguity around obligations of political leaders whose primary role, after all, is to lead and protect their people. There may also be a real tension between the wrongness of killing, which I do not dispute in every case, both from a human and a Christian perspective, and on the other side, the duty to love one's neighbor when the fate of that neighbor is unjustly, proximately, and extremely threatened. That being said, however, and this is my second point, it is vital for nonviolent peace builders not to get distracted or bogged down in debates about when killing might be justified or about the continuing value of just war theory, if any. Those conversations are pro probably more likely to result in the normalization of just war discourse than they are in serious political efforts to restrain and limit war. We need, I think, to keep our focus on the practical political possibility of ending nonviolence, reconciling opposed groups, and renewing social institutions by using the methods of nonviolent resistance, not armed force. That is our job, and most certainly the job of the leaders of the Christian churches. We see this very well in the example of Pope Francis, whose overriding dedication is to nonviolence. So thirdly, then, we must actively seek to spread nonviolence initiatives and solutions. First, we should be in solidarity with all those in direct situations of conflict. 
accompanying them, and if possible, financially supporting their peace building efforts, whether they are in Ukraine or Syria or Myanmar or Tigray. Uh, and in the last lecture, uh, Rosemary Berger gave numerous beautiful examples from Ukraine uh, uh, in regard to such accompaniment and support. Secondly, and even more importantly, as citizens of a variety of places in the world, and I'll speak for myself and for many of you, we live in the United States of, of America, which is ostensibly a democratic nation. And as members of a church with a social mission, we have a responsibility to mobilize our fellow Americans and our government leaders to adopt policies that lead to less, not more, violence in our own country and around the world. This includes action on uh, gun control here at home, uh, policing here at home, and more globally on fossil fuels, fuels and climate change, on mineral extraction, which supports our electronic devices and our electronic cars, on economic activities that exacerbate global poverty and hence drive conflict, or US military presence wherever Americans discern a threat to our own interests. How can we be nonviolent peace builders? Not only those who, who observe and admire peace builders abroad, but who are actually trying very seriously to end divisions and promote the common good for people of color in the United States, for immigrants, for LGBTQ persons, right here in our own communities. We must be active and we must turn the nonviolence lens back on ourselves and our communities. Fourth then, and finally, so this is my fourth point over the tension between nonviolence and um, just war or some sort of justifications of armed force. And my, force, my fourth point is, remember that Catholicism is a big tent church and that nonviolent peace building and just peace are inclusive mandates. Pacifism may be a vocation to which we are strongly committed, but there are many in the Catholic church and in society more generally who are what might be called stringent or limited just war thinkers. These people use just war criteria mainly to reject and not to defend specific instances of the use of armed force. They too are dedicated to just and nonviolent peace as the first and most comprehensive priority, not only of Christians, but of all humane and just politics. This fact is underlined in part one of advancing nonviolence, which was discussed in the first two lectures, when the book calls the spread of nonviolence a sign of the times. Many diverse partners are joining and should be welcomed in the mission to advance nonviolence and just peace. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, just conclude with a quote. And the quote is actually the very last sentence of part two of this book, which Professor Choi and I have been introducing tonight. And the sentence is this, in an age that is undergoing what Pope Francis has named a wor world war in installments, we are called today to respond to global violence and injustice with decisive action in a spirit of nonviolent love throughout the church and in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and Casey, for your excellent presentation. A lot of food for thought tonight. Um, I would like to invite you all to take a moment just to reflect on Casey's and Lisa's presentation and insight. Uh, feel free to use the chat box to share a word or two or a phrase that stood out to you or anything that came to your mind. <laughs> 